Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Unlock the Middle's Sunday night show, our flagship show, where we, every week, find somebody who's just amazing in education and that wants to bring the fire and share it out to people around the country. My name is Dean Packard, and I am one of the co-founders of Unlock the Middle. And alongside of me tonight, I have Josh Tovar from the great state of Texas. It's good to see you, my friend. I'm going to tell you something, Josh. I haven't watched a single play of football today, and I don't know why. I've just been busy trying to help out my daughter do something, but I don't even know who won today. That's how bad I am right now. How are you, my friend? Happy Sunday. Nice to see you. Happy Sunday, everybody. Josh Tovar, proud principal of Memorial Pathway Academy in Garland ISD, Garland, USA, Texas, here. And you know what? The commanders did a very represent, they represented well for us today. You know, it's kind of hard being a Washington fan here in Texas, but you know what? It's being <laughs> done. And you know what? It's my cross to bear, but they lost to Kirk Cousin, but it's okay. My, just like you, I was washing the, you know, washing clothes, putting them up. I was watching the, the, the game. But you know what? It's those things that we need to do as family members. We also need to incorporate our prep for tomorrow as school leaders. Sure. But most importantly, this part right here, which is all about getting better together. Free PD at your fingertips. No excuse. So it doesn't matter where you're from, whether it be from Alaska or Hawaii, whether it be from Maine all the way down to Florida or anywhere in the 48 in the middle, you're here together. So if you see it on the rebroadcast, please like it and share it with others because you know what? We have a great guest today. He's all over the place. I don't have the energy that that guy has. He's doing this. He's here. He's there. He's in soccer. He's teaching. I don't know what he's doing. But you know what? That's the caliber of people that we have here at Unlock the Middle because they're here to provide us with their knowledge, with their tool set, so that we all become better. Hey, you know, I, I'll tell you what. We had that quick conversation. What? Well, are you still going? Do you need a break? You yeah, got to come air? Go. You, you got you to come up for air? I think I think so, Josh. I love how you get that stuff going. Hey, no, we had a quick uh, talk with Brandon before the before the show today. I love what he does, and I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with him. Not only is he a teacher, but he also dabbles in that coaching world where that you get that deeper tie to kids. And you want to talk about building educational connections? That's from the coaching world. That's real to kids. And I'll tell you, you carry that from the classroom to the fields, where Wherever you go and you talk about those things that are important man i get excited about that josh so i'll tell you what let's bring let's bring in brandon right now let's introduce him to our, our followers let's have some fun brandon welcome to the show man great to guys, have you with us great to be here how are you guys doing out outstanding thanks hey we were just talking about you know you got a couple of uh guys who've been in educa education for a long time but also have a background in coaching and i just love when the two of them come together because it's there's endless possibilities because you know where kids thrive most is where they really want to be sometimes being in that math class isn't the same as what it's being like on a, on a soccer field or a baseball field or a basketball court you know so again when you can tie that all together man great stuff so brandon why don't you talk a little bit about yourself your rise to where you are today and just kind of give a little bit of a background so everybody can know what you're all about. Yeah, absolutely. Hope everybody is doing well. That's uh, That was quite, quite an introduction. But uh, so I am from Westchester County, New York, um, and I was born and raised upstate. So I'm not really from Westchester County, New York. But that's kind of where I've been for the last 20 years. And the story of the, how that happened is pretty wild. But anyways, the whole idea of getting to where I am and, and where where we are and what we're talking about today. And I happen to be on Unlock the Middle, and I wrote the book Unlocking Unlimited Potential in 2020. Um, so so I appreciate, well, first of all, I appreciate that. And uh, just the kind of the rise of, I've always been an educator. Both of my parents uh, were educators, you know, a total of 92 years uh, when you add their years and then you add in my 18 years. So I'm pushing at least like 110. That should be at least recognized by some organization, maybe it's not like a state organization, but I'll take it. Um, my father was a soccer coach. I kind of grew up ball boying on the ball on the sidelines and always loved the passion of the game. I played all through my life and always loved it. Went and played in college, played a little bit of a short stint as I kind of went from college playing semi-professional, dabbling in the idea that I was going to, um, be a professional soccer player and you know i received a call when i was sitting in my graduation seat you know in my graduation attire and 
received a phone call from a coach locally in this area, knew that I was coming to Westchester and was like, how would you like to coach at Briarcliff High School? And I was like, I've never heard of it. Shit. <laughs> the beauty of being live no worries <laughs> you never know who's gonna call oh man i i my got i got us new phone the other day i'm so sorry and then i like no worries geez, i like lost you guys i'm not like there you go you're back on the screen sorry um so i don't know where i lost you there but anyways um i'm just hey. going back to the whole idea of just coaching and and you know got this call that i was going to um you know, take this job and took it on a whim before I even had a teaching job, then got a teaching job in New York City schools um, in for and taught there. It was the craziest, most rewarding year of my life um, being in an inner city school and just happened to kind of stumble across a, a school district that was neighboring the district that I was coaching in. Um, and they're two very different districts. One is very, very diverse um, socioeconomic and ha Hispanic Latino. And I kind of, after a few years fell into the place of raising my hand when they were talking about a dual language program coming through fifth grade and I'm a monolingual and I don't speak Spanish, but I personally believe in the power of language and culture and all of that work. And that led me through several years of doing that. And the long story short was as I was doing that, I was always willing to do whatever it take. I was always willing to raise my hand. I was always willing to, to go to bat for my students. And I had an amazing team of, of teachers around me that I still have around me um, today. And it just kind of all of that around me, I still didn't feel like I was a like a, an adequate, like strong enough teacher and I just kind of wondered why and I happened to be in a doctorate program at the time and that led me to like changing my life as I was changing the way that I was looking things and, and starting to wonder and think about this whole idea of self-efficacy I've always been a reader of Tony Robbins Jack Canfield you know Rachel Hollis Brene Brown those personal development authors out there that are always preaching about the importance of self-efficacy personal development goal setting um and just you know, trying to take all of that and, and go through that just became a really interest in my really like obsessive interest in my um and I connected with a lot of people about it. And that was kind of what came out of my my work. It came out of what's this idea of, you know, are there other people out there that feel like this, that feel like me? You know, I was a person who had a nat has a national board certification in education in teaching. I went through that process. I have, I'm working towards a doctorate at that point. Now I have a doctorate. You know, there's still times when I show up every single day where I'm like, man, this work is hard. <laughs> and, you know, it's just sometimes we just need a little, a, a little pat on the back, a little bit of a, a, a system or a mindset or a shift or a person to talk to or just a, a, a different way to connect. For me, it's just rocking out super loud music in the morning in my hallway every single morning with my students and being out there and just being at a different level and bringing my dog to school. I bring a dog to school every single day. So life has been like really great where I am in the classroom and, um, you know, the book and, and being able to work in schools and the fact that I'm coaching and being able to work with athletes and, and being able to speak at schools with athletes has just been such an amazing experience how all of these things kind of came together after like 92 years of family experience and, and just all of the idea of, you know, this idea of inside of us is a story that makes us really powerful. And that to me is what it's really all about, which led to, you know, the idea of a podcast. So there's, that's kind of in a nutshell, like the 900 things that happened when I had a little extra time during the pandemic and, I tried to rise as much as I could and, and and share as much as I could. I love the energy. Josh. Hey, Brandon, before you tell me a little bit about unlocking unlimited potential, before you tell me about that, all right, and how it got started, tell me yeah. about a goalkeeper's life. Tell me, because a lot oh. of people, you know, people that don't know the Such game. Such a good question. People I, was that a high school goalie. I was a high school goalie. I'm going to call it right now. They, they say that guy must be bored. They say that guy does nothing. Can you please tell our audience real quick 
about the life of a goalkeeper. And then we could get into that unlocking the <laughs> unlimited potential. But tell, uh, tell, tell us out there. Yeah, the life of the goalkeeper, man. That's where that's where unlimited potential is found quite often. You know, your inner worth. You're the guy who has to pick up the ball out of the back of the net um, after it's went through all the other people. And But at the end of the day, that net is – that's your home. You're supposed to protect it. And you take it really personally – and you take it, you know, you take offense to the fact that someone put the ball into the back of the net. So um, that is an area and a zone you cherish. And so um, the, the, the mindset piece, you know, it's funny you say that because my first introduction even to teaching was co coaching goalkeepers as I was a goalkeeper the whole my whole career. And I happened to be like really, really connected. And I actually just spoke to him like two days ago as I was driving to a really big game and it was my goalkeeper coach. And he was just a super high level goalkeeper coach who'd worked with national team players. And I, he lived near me and I would go to his house and we would train there. He had lived on a farm and um, you know, he, all, there was always a mindset about it. And, you know, the idea is that my ball attitude, right. You know, this is my ball. And that my ball of attitude is that it's nobody else's and that being able to have that fearlessness and that ability to just go in and commit to something. It's so many lessons in life um, related to the sport, but also just being the goalkeeper, man. The goalkeeper is just it's a very different position. We train differently. Um, we laugh at field players that just kind of like jog around the field and where we're like taking balls off our face and our stomach and, you know, wherever else it hurts. <laughs> Let us know about unlock, unlocking unlimited potential. Tell us a little bit. Be specific on that. Yes, absolutely. There it is right there. I'll put a little, little plug there for myself. So, um, yeah, unlocking unlimited potential. So where I was going before was kind of the story of how the book kind of came into fruition. And the book came into fruition through that time of the pandemic when it hit, I started to say, I was always saying to myself since I was in a doctorate program that I was going to write a book. And it wasn't until I changed my tune to, I am writing a book that is being published by August. So by doing that small tweak, you know, I, it led me down a place. I, I went down the road of investing in a, in a, in a personal development coach from Tony Robbins um, that I met with, you know, three times a month through the process to be able to just make sure that I could line up not only this, because I also had a business, have a business. I'm, you know, a professional soccer coach who also is connected to a business that has the opportunity to have coaches and you know people on soccer fields on a regular basis sometimes on a saturday or sunday i may have 20 25 coaches out on fields and they're all out there doing a curriculum that we've designed together and they're working their way up through the ranks so it's something that's grown into something that i really enjoy doing and so i'm lucky to be a part of that so with the whole idea of all of this work and being able to connect all of these things together, being a teacher, being a coach, being an educator, being, you know, a speaker, being a podcaster, being a, a this, it just kind of all came into fruition of as I was taking all of the work that I was doing and, and the research that I was doing with teachers, especially the, the research that I happened to the, the research, the foundation of this book was was it just kind of came a little seed of it was because it came from my work with teachers of of language learners and i happen to be in a school district that is now almost 60 percent hispanic latino and i have kids in my class that are from you know on a reading level of they just came to the country this a couple weeks ago and they've come in fast and they've come in fast, man, where I am. They've come in fast, more than more than I can say in these stories. Oh, my God, I could go for hours and hours. Like, there is no story like these kids' stories. It's, it's incredible to hear that they're even there. And they don't even – I don't even speak English. I don't even speak Spanish with them because they can't speak English. But we create a way to connect. One of those ways happens to be my dog. But – and all of those pieces just kind of – it's the story of that. The book's broken into 
to three parts. And it's, you know, building that foundation, that why, that use of social emotional learning and the growth mindset piece to be building the foundation. And the second part is using challenges as opportunities for growth. So using that story of me being a teacher in an uncomfortable place, but wanting to be there, how powerful that is to not only me, but that's also powerful to my students. And that will push me through the hard stuff in the long run. And for me, that's kind of where it comes from. And then the third part is just that believing in you. So now I put together the, I take the Maslow and I take, you know, John Wooden and I take the pyramid and I put them together. And I say to you, you know, I put together Tony Robbins. I put together uh, Brene Brown. I put together other people in there, you know, um, Howard Gardner and just, just kind of give you like a little bit of a mind blowing uh, belief that, all of these people are all talking about that pinnacle to success. And that pinnacle to success, success is when, they've, when you've unlocked unlimited potential. It's the ultimate goal of all educators out there is to do that. We can't do it every single day with every single person, but we can shoot for it. And if we shoot for it, I think that we have to find our way to do it because the journey towards unlocking unlimited potential begins with you. You have to start with you first. If you're not fired up, if you're not wired up, if you're not ready to go, if you're not finding a way to be happy about being in front of the students that are in front of you, then you have to start elsewhere or you have to look within. You got a little Dave Burgess in you right there with that fire. That's all I'm going to say. I don't know how well you know him, but I'll, I'll tell you, you, you kind of had me when you started talking about curriculum for your coaches, you know, only because of the fact that as an ex high school basketball coach, a common language curriculum that is uh, built from the bottom up is essential for success year over year over year. We go back to talking about systems all the time. Strong systems breed great results. They really do. You fly by the seat of your pants. I don't care what you're coaching, what you're teaching, you're going to have subpar results every single year. So kudos for you for doing that. I'd love to see what that looks like. Let's let's dig a little deeper into your stories though from this podcast, okay? So what give, give us an example of a couple of stories that have really resonated with you that have really like turning points for you to say, you know what, this is amazing. And this is why I'm doing what I'm doing from that story level. Oh, God. And I know easy. you probably have a lot. So just so easy. Working. No, this is so easy. I'm going back like last week. So I'm going to go right there. So as you know, I'm a coach. I'm a varsity soccer coach. I've been a coach at Briarcliff Manor High School for 18 years. And in the past six years, we've been really doing really well, but it's just been a strong program that's been building throughout the years. Just incredible kids, incredible people. I love to do it. It's it's so hard to walk away from. Like I, I just don't even think about it anymore because it's so much fun. Um, and just an incredible reminder this year. So my team... In New York State is broken down into, I believe it's 13 sections. Um, and every section has a champion. Um, and then from there, you go on to the state tournament and it goes there. So and back in 2018, we went and uh, we went and won the sectional championship. We went all the way to the regionals. We went and won, went to the state final. Um, we lost in the state final 2018. Um, the year before that, we went lost in the sectional final in the the ball in in overtime hit the crossbar. My goalkeeper looked back at it. It hit him in the face. It rolled into the back of the net. Game set match season over. So that was 2017. Let me rewind for a second. That same team in 2018 is the team that went to the state final. So, I mean, you talk about redemption and you talk about just the incredible story i mean it, it couldn't have been better than that one um and i know i see kip schubert there so he he knows for sure what i'm talking about fellow soccer coach um you know just the idea that um really that anything can happen through a season and and what it does when it brings together a group of kids and what it does for a community is just really amazing and so fast forward to this year you know this year we go into the season and every year i have a word i have one word i have a phrase i have something the season's about and i announce it at the end of the season 
in the like end of the year dinner. It's like the last slide, drum roll, please, boom. And it usually comes from a story of the year before. So I just kind of found myself kept saying this to the stu- to the players over and over is like, we can't be unbeaten. I mean, no matter what, like if we lose, you know, we, ha- you know, the, the idea is we have to be unbeaten in all the moments, you know, in whatever moment it is. And so that ended up being our word. But, it, and, you know, I said unbeaten. I said, I just want to make it clear. Unbeaten does not mean that we're going to be undefeated. We're going to lose. Like, we're going to lose things. Like, that's not what I'm asking. I'm just saying, just be unbeaten as a team. Like, don't let anything knock you down. And so it was the craziest year. So they get end up they're they're winning. They're like six and zero, seven and zero. You know, we had a tie like third game. So it was like six zero and one, seven zero and one, eight zero and one. Now all of a sudden, state rankings come out. We're climbing up, climbing up. Now we're you know like three you know two thirds of the way through the season, and we're sitting there with a you know a number one state ranking on us because we haven't lost a game. And so now we're going into playoffs and now we're a team with a number one state ranking. And, you know, now we're playing unbelievable, you know, strong teams with coaches that had coached for like 35 years and coaches that I had worked with and connected with through my like United States Soccer Federation connections. So so quality coaches, guys who've been to this tournament, so many, the finals so many times. So it was just an absolute gauntlet. And we had to, we had to literally be unbeaten the entire way through when we got into playoffs, I was like, guys, the really there's the only way out is we either lose or we go unbeaten because we put ourselves in this position. So it was just kind of like super poetic and crazy. And you want to know the craziest thing. Do you guys, have you guys ever heard of uh, the energy bus by John Gordon? Yeah. Okay. So the craziest thing is I love the book, the energy bus by John Gordon. I kind of use those principles in in some of the work I do. And the bus in the book is number 11. So I'm driving home. I drive to the games um, because I can't get to the bus in time. And I'm driving behind our bus on the way home as we're getting like a police escort because we won this championship. And I look up and it's bus number 11. And I'm like, as they got back, I'm like, that was the the number in the energy bus. The energy bus was number 11 from his book. So it was like the craziest like story that I could even imagine. But yes, that is my reminder of of why, like of everything about it. Like the, the best thing about it, you want to know the best thing about it was at the end when we're celebrating the kids that are coming up to me and giving me like, coach, that was the greatest season ever. I'd love this. It was the play. Yep. Like that was to me, I'm like sitting there. I'm like, you get it, man. You just get it. Huge. Let me let me just take this and spin it for one second. I know you can dovetail this into your overarching thought process. How do you take unbeaten from the field and bring it into the classroom? And that's just a simple thing just to resonate for a second. Give yourself a little wait time. And just all those teachers that are out there right now, because the passion you put on the field belongs also in that classroom with every student that's in front of you. How do you make that number 20 kid in that classroom feel unbeaten, too? That's so good. That's a good question. I love it. I'm so ready for it. That's, you know, that's that belief, right? Like, how do you instill that belief, belief in, in, you know, importance and significance inside of, of the people around you? Um, you do it with your heart, man. You just love them. You just, and, and when I say love them, I mean, like, really, like, get to know who they are to know their story, like get to know and appreciate where they come from and what they have. And, and, you know, understand that my story is way different than my students' stories. And, you know, you, you, number one, first and and foremost, is that they are human and they are going to get on your nerves. I mean, I teach 10 and 11 year old kids, you know, and they're like on the road to middle school and it's, you know, I also have my own children. I also have a 12 year old, a nine year old and a two year old. So, you know, I, I it's it's a lot. Kids are a lot. So but I I try to just kind of like love and, and share and make my environment as enjoyable for them so that they can interact because their interaction and their connection is what's going to keep us all moving forward. I love it. Excellent point. Excellent point. Josh. Hey, Brandon. 
Um, I don't want to gloss over what you stated earlier. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we had, uh, I think, one of our best shows with different uh, educators that deal with emerging bilingual students. And that's, um, and more often than not, the majority of us are facing that. Just so that you know, the home that I, I live in, that's all there, Afghanis, and Salvadoreños, Africans, Af Vietnamese, that's all I have. That's all it is. So those are my children. And so before, you know, you talked to us about being a keynote speaker, I know that that's one of the major crises going on across not only not having enough teachers, but as all of our children are moving out to different parts of the United States, a lot of our educators don't know how to teach them, for lack of a better term, or focus. Um, you know what? The majority of us are being facing that situation. So what nugget can you drop there to just... Try to give them like some some FYI for that, and then talk to us about being a you know spreading your message of uh, wherewithal uh, uh, as a keynote speaker. It's so funny you say that because at the beginning of my like keynote speaking career and getting out and speaking at conferences began in conferences for students of you know emergent students that were immersion bilinguals, English language learners, um, because that's just kind of where my work began and it was a place that I just needed to get stronger at. And you know, what advice can I give is that no one has the answers. That's the advice I can give you. No one has the answers. These students that are coming from different locations and different places, they speak Spanish. My God, they speak 17 different kinds of Spanish. There are so many different dialects. There are so many different languages and so many different ways. But some of us are just lucky because, yeah, if you speak Spanish, you might have a connection with a student who is trying, who speaks Spanish, who's trying to learn English, but they may not speak Spanish. There may be all the different languages that are out there. I happen to just be in a place where it's more con concentrated Hispanic Latinos. So I also, you know, I'm also, I am also a professor at, a university where I give the TESOL certification course work and I do teach foundations of bilingual education. I do teach um, areas of, of this work because I re really, really believe that the problem is, and this is what research has found because this is where my research was rooted in way, way back when, is that the problems Okay, and the perception of the problems is really what it is. The perception of the problems far outweigh the real problems. You know, the real problems is, you know, the perception is, oh, well, they don't know English, so they're never going to be able to blah, 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 blah. You know, it's always that English only idea that a lot of people come from and they think like, oh, okay, well, I can only use English, but no, I God, I was doing this before Google Translate. Now that we have Google Translate, holy cow, like mind blown. I can share letters with kids. It's the craziest thing. Like we can share so much. So it's it's really just that idea. And I do talk about it in my book, actually. You know, the 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 title of the chapter is called Language Learners Are a Gift. You know, because they were so there's there, it's such a gift to me in my experience. I mean, I went to high school and I went to school in a place that had no Hispanic Latino, that had no diversity in upstate New York, where I happened to be. There was very little diversity. So, and then I went to the Bronx and taught in the Bronx, where it was very black white. It was most of the people were Jamaican um, and very little diversity outside of that. So I was in these different places. And then as I moved to this place is now it's more diverse, but there's that growing Hispanic Latino population. I just want to serve, man, I can connect so well with soccer. I can connect so well with soccer. I don't even care what language I, I speak, but when kids walk into my classroom and they see Barcelona and they see Messi and they see that I have like pictures at Camp Nou because I've been there because my soccer journey has taken me there several times. Our connection is instant. I mean, football is is really. Yeah, I keep coming back to it, but it just is what it is. So, sorry, soccer. <laughs> football, if you want and, to call it when that. You, yes. When you go out, what, what kind of keynotes do you take charge of there, Brendan? Who, who do you go speak to? Yeah, no, absolutely. So my whole 
platform is just really what I what I said about the story behind the book. But the in in essence, what it is is unlocking unlimited potential. So when I'm going out there and speaking, I'm doing workshops, or I'm going out there and I'm doing a a, a keynote to a group of educators. Or I even go, my message is really wide. And what's cool is that I can even do my message with, I've done it with camp counselors. I've done it with camp administration staff for summer camps. And what I also do because of my coaching background, because of my education and coaching education that I have, and my experience as a coach is I've also developed programs where I go in and I do leadership rallies and I meet with captains, I meet with coaches, I meet with, you know, whatever the experience is required to unlock the unlimited potential in what you're trying to achieve. Because, you know, sharing the message with students is awesome. Sharing the message with educators, awesome. Parents, awesome. You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But just being able to share the message. And most importantly, what we do in our workshops is, you know, in addition to this idea of sharing our stories is, I'm going to give you a little piece, I'll tell you right now is my three things are, is the idea of self efficacy comes from three things, it comes from your story, your why, and your purpose. And those three things reciprocally interact to basically determine who you are and who you want to be. And so that's kind of the work that I do. That's the the kind of layout of how it works. I mean, we're in a, in a, in a session, you know, and I'm speaking to you is awesome. I love a workshop because I'm connected with you and we're really digging in and I'm actually able to walk you through and get you through an action plan. Um, Darren Peppard and I, um, I saw him on here. Shout out to my brother there. Um, him and I are also, you know, we've connected so much in this journey through becoming results coach and and being able to work with other educators and and work with educators to help them get to where they want. People that want to write a book, that want to speak. I have 20 years of business experience with social media, with, you know, with running a business, with, you know, being a part of an organization that has been around for a while and it's actually been around for 45 years and in, in where I am. It's given me a little bit of background to be able to say, I want to share this with others. And so, like you guys all said, like we're all called to something, right? And I think the pandemic was an important time for all of us to be called to something because in the pandemic, we were either called to, you know, to serve or we were called to kind of, you know, to die. You know, we, we either thrive during this time or we either took the big dive. And if we're gonna continue to thrive, you have to continue to share what you're passionate about. Like, I think people out there that are that are filming themselves and showing videos of like, you know, exercises and strategies and just talking about their day or an issue they went through. Like, I personally say to you, share it like crazy. Because if that is you and that's who you believe you are and if you're doing it for the purpose of helping other people, then please continue to share because we're all benefiting. Because as long as you know one person watches this show or or listens to a podcast or something that you know we've all had a part of, then I think that's why we all do this at the end of the day. And and to me, that's what it's all about. Brandon, I got a question for you in regards to social emotional learning post COVID. Um, you started a program, Mudagrees. Um, and I'm, I'm enthralled by it because you say you bring your dog to school every day. There's something about animals and connecting with kids to balance regulatory needs. Uh, you know, we don't do that in our district at this point in time. But boy, I know that uh, my son has a puppy. I brought him in. I brought it to our therapeutic room. And that little puppy was, everybody was just like, oh. And it was really, really nice to watch kids just kind of become balanced. So why don't you talk a little bit about this particular program and why you have championed it, number one. And number two, the results you've seen as moving forward from doing this. Well, the reason why I championed it is because I was dumb enough to read an article about it from Time for Kids to my class uh, of 10 and 11-year-old kids about dogs in classrooms. And then when I finished it, what did they ask? Can we get one? <laughs> and so I went home to my own kids 
And I read the same article. And of course, they asked the same question. Can we get one? And so I reached out. I basically just, you know, reached out to Time for Kids. And I was like, hey, I, I read this. Can you guys send me the contact information? And they gave me the contact information to the people at Mudagrees, um, which is a social emotional learning curriculum out of Yale University that is connected to an animal saving organization called the Pet Savers, as well as North Shore Animal League. I think I got it all there. That's a mouthful, but that sounds about right. Point is, is this organization is incredible and they're putting dogs all over the United States, all over the world, actually. Um, and they are getting them in school. And I reached out and just kind of thought I'd hear from them like in a couple months. And I didn't, I heard from them like right away. And they're like, oh, get it, let's have a chat. And so the incredible Jane Vital, um, she was an amazing person there, with spearheads their education side, talks to me. Brandon, this is great, answered my 937,000 questions. And then even spoke to like my superintendent and I went to my super and I was like, look, here's the deal. Um, I'm gonna go get a dog um, through this organization. I'm gonna write a grant um, that funds it so that, you know, it can pay for itself. And, you know, we can get this thing off the ground running and, you know, it should happen in like three to six months. And then the organization calls me back like three days later. And they're like, Brandon, what do you think about a poodle? Because I was looking for a hypoallergenic dog. I was looking for like a golden doodle. I was looking for like the top shelf here. And they're like, what do you think of a poodle? I'm like, ah, I don't know. I'm thinking like the puffy butts, you know, the, the you know, the, the haircuts, the, you know, the, the dog show look. And I'm like, no, nah, I don't know about that. And she's like, no, really, Brandon. She's like, you're going to love her. She's like, they're really, really great at hiking and they're awesome with kids and they're super intelligent. She's like, do your research and call me back. I was like, all right, I did my research. I get home. She sends me a, a video, 13 second video of this dog laying on its back. And there's all I see is just hands all over her belly. And it's like, I'm like, what is that? I'm like, is that stuffed animal? She's like, no, that's peaches, the dog that I want you to come meet. It's a 13 week old black standard poodle. I'm like, all right, well, I guess I got to go meet it. So we met, we met her and we, uh, we took her home, started the process kind of like my school was just kind of along for the ride when we, we started and we knew that it was just kind of our plan to bring her in like every once in a while. And of course, like I had to bring her in and I had to get her trained. So it took me like actually class that the first class that were a part of like getting her to come in really only had like one day. It was like the last day of school. Cause I had to come up with a way I had to work with a, with a dog trainer. I had to work and create this program that allows to, to create a kind of like a small piece of certification that would get us to the point where we could really, you know, push forward and, and, and create something bigger. And, and so we had to bring her into the school with no, with nothing in the in the school no students and you know then we could add her and bring her for like an hour and so it was like one thing after another this whole process and so yes yeah, that happened before the pandemic and so by the time the pandemic hit she was coming in like full on like three or four days a week and she was working with like a hundred kids so she would work in my classroom in another classroom in a, in a reading room and with it with the with the assistant principal who'd walk her around the school she'd have an hour and a half break built into her day um just really like an incredible incredible thing and the whole school has just rallied around it and just the the administration everybody has just been so supportive the, the program is now in its third year running and um when i tell you it's uh, when I bring my dog to school, it's like everybody, all the other teachers, they're like, oh, hey, Peaches. I'm like, I'm right here. I'm <laughs> right here. And, you know, and it's it's but it's it is what it is. I mean, that's that's what it is. My dog gets a lot of attention. Um, but that's when she's in school. My kids are like, is Peaches here? And they're like, I'm like, no, buddy, she's not here today. Like, oh, my class, when they walk in, they do not they can't look at her when they walk in in the morning there's a rule that they have to be like sit it seated and have their things out ready to go because we just don't want her to like have this thing so we train the students who train the dog 
which is lessons in life, which is lessons in everything. And one of the coolest things that I was also able to do is I was able to get on a Zoom call during the pandemic with Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, which was incredible. And it was just like me and six other people. And he was in his living room and he was just he was just spewing knowledge of his belief about animal and intel- his, you know, the theory and everything about animal, you know, emotions and intelligence and how, you know, the difference between when a dog comes into the room and a human comes into the room, sees, use their eyes, a dog comes in the room, uses their nose, like little things like that, that were just, it was really, it's, it's really incredible. I still bring her to school um, almost every day now because she just, my class is just really a better place for everyone. And, and for when she's there and obviously she's pretty popular now and anybody in school pretty much knows who she is. Hey, Brennan, I mean, coaching, playoffs, speaking, mud agrees. How do you have time to find a business? I know it's your love. You mentioned it. You mentioned it earlier, and that's who you are. Since the moment you had your cap and gown and you were asked to go help kids, and that's what your, your passion is. So how, how do you incorporate your love and passion with your business? Yeah. No, well, first of all, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, uh, it's, I really feel like a lot of the things that I've had the opportunity to be a part of or been called to have been, you know, all part of a, a, a bigger story. You know, I, I really feel like all of these, you know, if I look back through some of the stories of my life and I think about like the end of my actual soccer playing career was the worst soccer game that I ever played. I made one of the stupidest mistakes in one of the biggest games in the NCAA tournament. And it, I could probably never really recovered fully from it. But, and I remember being on the phone call after that with professional scouts that were at the game and they were just kind of not really too interested And I was hurt. I was broken. Um, And then like two, you know, fast forward, like five or six months later, and I'm receiving a phone call when I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I'm graduating college and where, you know, I'm moving to a new location. And it's ends up being like the heart of it all. Um, I just kind of follow my heart and I do my best to to really just do what's right and serve as many people as possible. And I've always felt that since that game that I had, that that bad game that I had, I've always felt that um, my my passion and my purpose is in is in guiding players to never feel like that ever again, to never feel like they let people down because of a, a mistake they made, you know? And so that that's that's my answer. I mean, I'm I'm sticking to it because I really feel like at the end of the day that if you follow your heart and it's I even had a subtle reminder in the sectional final, which is this is the craziest thing, man, because when you look back and reflect, you're like, did that really just happen? The goalkeeper on my team made the same exact mistake I made in my game. He dropped the ball and their guy was right there and he kicked it over the crossbar. I'm like, I'm, I'm like crying under my glasses as I'm watching this. I'm like, did that just happen? And then at the end, when we go into the game and we go into overtime and it's a corner kick and I'm preaching to the guys four minutes, this happens four minutes in the overtime. I'm preaching to the guys at, at the overtime, like, guys, this hasn't gone as planned and it's okay, but we're still here. And I'm like, we're still here. And I say, all we need is just one more. One throw in, one corner kick, one shot, one stop, one more. We get a corner kick and the ball goes in and the guy who's just been scrapping and fighting and digging and 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 all over the place leaps into the air, heads the ball into the net. And right there and then it, it's just that's, you know, when those things happen, you know, in those celebrations with students, you know, in those moments with those aha moments, when that, when you get to that, that kid that you've been trying so hard, you know, or that you get that kid that just, you know, now he's coming in and slapping you high five. And he wasn't even, he was looking at the floor before it all started, 
You know, he didn't even look up at you. He didn't share anything to you. He didn't even say hello to you. She, you know, she, she's never seen a, uh, you know, had a male influence in her life like that. Um, you know, those kinds of stories, just, they are constant reminders. Those, that's why you keep those notes that kids write you. You keep them in a poster, you put them all over, you make sure you put that stuff in front of you every single day. You better have be showered by those notes because those notes you should brag about. You should share those on social media. I like to read them, you know, and, and you gotta, you gotta keep going because that's, that's all we can keep doing, man. Life is, is way too sweet, way too short. And I've been only reminded too many times in my own family that, you know, it, it can be gone and taken from you in any moment. And so we have to have to find a way to do what we love and, and love what we do. Be unbeaten, man. Just be unbeaten. I just, I, it's, that's my takeaway. Just take that in every aspect of what you do in the world of education, working with kids, working with people, working within your community. Think about that for a second, man. You'll just glow and you'll get the way you need to be if you take that perspective. So thank you so much. Hey, where can people find your book if they want to purchase your book? You got that again? Can you throw that up there so I can see it? Yeah, absolutely. It. Brandon, yeah, Brandon, absolutely. Brandon Beck, edu .com, or, dot com. You can also find it on Amazon. You can also follow me on all my socials is Brandon Beck EDU. I try to keep it as simple as possible. And I would love to, you know, I would love to continue to connect. And, and like I told you guys, like this is my open season. So it's funny you say, how do you juggle it all? Well, I juggle the seasons and I juggle the times that I can kind of be in different places at different, you know, in different trajectories. So this is the time I'm ready to, uh, to get out there and connect and I can't wait to work. I got a bunch of sports teams lined up. I got a bunch of schools lined up and it's really cool because, you know, as I get a chance to share this work, I just meet such incredible people and like yourselves guys. So the work you guys are doing does not go unnoticed. I really appreciate what you guys are doing as well. Good stuff and across the board, Josh, take us home, man. And don't say we scored another touchdown. It's not the red zone, but I'll tell you what, one goal is all it takes. One shot to be great. One. Remember that. One. As an adamant soccer fan, I feel it. I felt the passion in your voice. And that last comment, I understand. I've seen that. I've seen that with our goalkeepers. I got you. I feel you, brother. I feel you. But you know what? There's a lot of knowledge right there dropped again. Remember, free PD. But it's not over. Because you know what, Dean? This Tuesday, we have office hours. Office our office. office hours are open. What time, Dean? What time are office hours? That's 9 o'clock Tuesday. 8 o'clock, Josh? I go, oh, why do you get those two mixed up? Oh, okay. my goodness. 8 o'clock. That That's right. What do I have Tuesday night? Is that I great if you show? 9 o'clock Thursday, 8 o'clock Tuesday. I got oh, it. Oh, my goodness. 20 hours, problem solving, <laughs> real world experiences for administrators. So listen to us. Find out the different perspectives because maybe you will face this situation because they're real world examples. Thank you very much, Brandon, for being here tonight. Join us for office hours. It's time to go relax and get ready for an awesome week of unlimited attention. Love it, guys. Brandon, stay out for one moment if you could, please. Everybody out there, have a great week with your kids. And remember, stay and be unbeaten. Thank you so much for joining us.